Hey, well, I'm glad to see a big group here. I, I you know, didn't know what to, what to expect when I gave the topic of Cyprus. In fact, I don't really remember sending it. I kind of think Chris may have uh, <laughs> made up the title. <laughs> he hounds me for titles, and sometimes I, I don't get them to. Um, but, but Cyprus are, are actually uh, an interesting group, and it's, um, when, when I'm, what we're going to look at today are the, the true Cypresses, Cupressus, and then uh, the false cypresses, some of the Camasipras. And we're not going to go through and look at every one in the Arboretum. We've got, we've got a lot here, a lot of species of cupressus, a lot of cultivars, especially the Camasipras. But we're going to look at some representatives of, of the different types and um, get a sense of, of what they're about, how they grow, um, what, what you know, makes them good garden plants in a lot of cases. And, and talk about some of the confusion in the, the um, Taxonomy of. In fact, we'll see some labels on plants that, that are really not correct at this point. So um, it's been, it's been a lot of that has been up in the air. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll give you the, the latest and, and the greatest with that kind of information. Um, as always with these tours, I love for um, people to uh, uh, chip in if they have uh, experiences with the plants, uh, if they agree with me, disagree with me. Uh, if you have questions, um, I, I'd love to answer them. Uh, you know, it's kind of a if, if I can't answer it, I'll, I'll make up something um, that sounds good. I'll start speaking Latin and, and uh, <laughs> you'll know. Um, but no, uh, the, the Cupressus and the Camasipras are far, part of uh, one of the, the, the biggest groups of, of conifers, the Cupressaceae. Um, the, uh, uh, the Cupressaceae is kind of a widespread group. Uh, Cupressus uh, range from kind of all around the really the north temperate zones um, there are some subtropical species but the US uh, you know North America Asia Europe kind of, kind of all the way around there um, Camasiparas have have a, a little bit odder um, distribution they're they're on the eastern United States they're uh, up in Canada uh, on the the west coast um, we have some Camasiparas and then uh, Japan and Taiwan uh, it really is the only places they're native. They grow them some in, in China, but, but they're really not native to, to China, the true Camasiparas. So kind of an odd dis, uh, disjunct with both sides of, of our continent and then um, Japan and Taiwan. There's about 17 species of Cupressus. Uh, many of them are very similar, although there is some, some, some differences. Uh, when we get to them and start looking at them, I'll, I'll explain some of the differences between Cupressus and Camasiparus, uh, what differences there, there are, which is kind of tough. Um, uh, Camasiparus, there, there are generally now recognized five species of, of Camasiparus. Any questions about the, the groups before we get started and actually looking at plants? All right, well, we're going to start right here in the corner here, so, so people don't have to move a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is one of our native North American species, Cupressus arizonica. Um, it's a weeping form, which kind of why it's propped up here and it's weeping down. It's, it's called raywood weeping, and you look see the branches are all kind of hanging down. Not a real um, graceful weeper, at least in youth. As it gets older, maybe it'll be uh, a little bit, a little bit better. But Cupressus arizonica uh, grows at kind of high elevations uh, in the, the, the Rockies, some areas like that. It's, um, you know, if, you, if you've ever been out there, say Denver, uh, if you, if the weather out there during the summers, it can get up in the 90s, it's blazing hot, it's really pretty brutal. During the winters, it can get extremely cold, and uh, well, during the winter, it can get pretty darn hot and then pretty cold pretty quickly, it goes up and down. So these are really tough trees, uh, for, for, you know, kind of tough environmental conditions. Um, Cupressus arizonica often are, are relatively blue, although there are green forms, uh, but a lot of the ones you see in cultivation are, are bluer. Um, there, there are several uh, that are out there. Um, Carolina sapphire, sapphire skies, silver smoke, all have that kind of blue uh, silvery cast to it. In general, and it's hard to say anything definite about Cupressus and Camasiparus, but in general, with uh, one of the, the features of uh, Cupressus that differentiates it from Camasiparus is that the, uh, the scale-like needles, and they're a little 
if you look at the look closely at it, you'll see there are little needles that are that are close up on the um, on the stems, and that'll be the same chemisifers. But the needles on cupressas are hard to differentiate. They're 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 two rank. There's on on each little branchlet there are a pair of scales that are like this, and then a pair of scales like this, and then a pair of scales like that, uh, kind of back and forth. On, on cupressas, for the most part, it's hard to differentiate the facing pairs. They they look the same no matter which kind of way you turn it. And when we see chemisifers, we'll see that those are mostly flatter, um, not so um, not so similar. Um, with, with both uh, with both genera, you get uh, little uh, pollen cones on the tips of the branchlets. You see, if you see these little kind of bulges, a little bit of yellow on the tips of the branchlets. Those are the pollen cones, the the male um, um, flowers, if you will. And then you see that's the the seed cone on on this Cupressus arizonica, kind of a uh, ovoid uh, woody cone. Uh, most Cupressus will open the the some the first year, more often the second year after they're formed. Uh, some need fire in order to open. They're, they're dependent on fire to, to pop them open. Um, but they're, you know, little, little, uh, the little female cones there. Um, they, they tend to be very aromatic, a lot of resins in there. Uh, when I finish this tour, my hands are going to be sticky as all get out uh, uh, because they are, they are kind of um, stuff like that. Uh, as you go back on the older stems, you go from kind of a greenish growth to uh, uh, purpley brown um, growth, and you can still see those those scales on there, those leaves on there as you go back. Um, you know, on the, the stems, uh, it's um, pretty easy to grow. Like I said, tough um, takes a lot of different environmental uh, kind of conditions. Likes full sun, does want sun, does not want shade. Uh, the one problem with these is where they grow. They tend to grow in very rocky areas, and so they send roots down and kind of anchor themselves in the rocks. Uh, they can be, when you put them in, you know, clay soils here, or even, you know, even worse, really nice, uh, fluffy, great garden soil, the stuff that you're trying to get in your gardens, they can be a little bit weak rooted, um, especially if you get a large one in, in a container. You're much better with a small one. Uh, and, and getting the roots established uh, that way and really growing out. But in high winds, you can often get them, them falling over, them lodging, especially if, uh, if it's, um, the soils are wet. They don't make that really dense fibrous root system so much uh, that, that anchors them in like you do with our, our native um, trees. So, so you can have some issues with them um, lodging in high winds. Questions? Anything I missed? Is this the parent of Leyland Cypress or is it something else? Uh, this is not one of the parents of Leyland Cypress. We'll, we'll talk about, about the parents. Um, actually, the next plant we go to will be one of the parents, and, and we'll look at the other parent, the last plant. Okay. Okay. And we'll look at Leyland's on, on, on our way. Um, that's part of all this confusion with names. They, they fit right in there, so we will look at them. But not a parent of, of the Leyland Cypress. Other questions or thoughts? Of all the varieties, what, would you recommend one or two that's best for North Carolina? Of the Cupressus arizonica? Um, probably my favorite, oh shoot, now I never can remember. Is it the top of the stairs? Somebody help me out. Is that Carolina Sapphire or Sapphire Skies? Sapphire Skies. Sapphire Skies, thank you. Sapphire Skies. It's harder to find than Carolina Sapphire, but form seems to be better, color seems to be better. Um, I'll point it out to you as, as we're not going to go right up to it because um, it's color wise and, and you know, there's a lot of similarities with this, only this is a week and four. So we'll, we'll, I'll point that out there. You can see it from here right say, now, just right, right over there. Oh, yeah, kind of right oh, yeah. there, one oh, blue yeah. uh, pyramid right there. It's right at the top of the stairs. It's harder to find than, than um, some of the other ones, but really it's the best. And uh, it's, it's the one I would search out if I were getting just one. All right. Other questions? All right, we're going to head right down. Um, down here, and there's a tree. There's this tree kind of sticking up and hanging down. We're gonna go right down to it. So um, I will meet y'all there. Okay, this next plant here is uh, we have it labeled as Xanthocypris nutcatensis, uh, which is not correct, most likely. Um, this is a, a plant that grows up in the, the Pacific Northwest, Nootka, Alaska. Um, you know, up, up that way. Camisipris nutcatensis. It, it was it was known for for years as Camisipris nutcatensis, and the reason it was considered a Camisipris is because 
uh, as I mentioned, those, those needles, you can easily distinguish the, the facing, the different needles uh, on here, the, the scale-like needles. The ones on the sides kind of stick out farther, the ones on the top are more pressed. So it makes for a flat, kind of a flat spray instead of those rounded uh, branchlets that you have on compresses. There's always been confusion with this plant. Um, and uh, there was a, a new plant found in Vietnam that was named Xanthocypris vietnamensis. It's, it's still, it's extremely difficult to, to find. I know somebody with a whole bunch of it in, in a greenhouse and he's got an agreement with the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh uh, and is not allowed to give them out. And he gives out plants to me all the time and I cannot get one from him. So he, they, they have threatened him at, at Edinburgh with this. So, um, so that was found, it was named Xanthocypris vietnamensis, and then somebody started looking and said, well, you know, this Camocypris nutcatensis, which never really seemed like a Camocypris, never quite fit in with Camocypris, um, we think maybe, maybe that should be Xanthocypris. And, uh, and so that's where we named it, because it really does fit in more closely with Xanthocypris vietnamensis. However, once somebody did that, they really started looking at it, started doing more DNA work in recent years, and realized that, that this and, and probably Xanthocypris vietnamensis also are really DNA they group with cupressus. So, so really, most authorities now consider this cupressus uh, newt catensis. Um, the two main conifer taxonomists, there's uh, Farjan, who still calls this Xanthocypris, and Eckenwalder, who calls this Cupressus, but Eckenwalder is getting the, the bulk of the, the actual empirical data to, to support his position. So, so I think that's where it has to go. You know, if you put them, them in a room, they probably get into a slap fight. Uh, <laughs> um, probably more than y'all wanted to know about the, <laughs> the botanical uh, nomenclature battles that are, that are out there. At any rate, uh, cupre cupressus uh, uh, newt catensis, which is what I'm going to try and get myself to remember to call this, and we'll change our labels on it and everything, uh, is a, makes a large um, uh, conifer. It's usually a pretty, um, uh, you know, it's a broad pyramidal kind of, kind of gentle uh, branchlets on there. This is one called Jubilee that goes up stays very narrow and then weeps very uh, very close down. There, there's another one, green arrow, that's even narrower. Um, if you want it variegated, you can get sparkling arrow, which is variegated and hangs straight down. Uh, you go up to uh, the west coast to Isley Nursery and you can get ones in boxes that are, you know, 25 feet tall already and it's just like a, a straight up and straight back down. Um, it's, uh, it's fruit is more like, uh, is really close to uh, Camocypris. That's one of the reasons why it was lumped there, but uh, it's got, got more cupressus in, it, in its veins, I guess. Um, it'll grow in, it prefers sun, but it'll grow in some shade. Uh, it tends to be a well-rooted plant. Um, it does, you know, it's grown up on, on the uh, coast of Alaska, but tolerates our heat pretty well. Uh, there's another western species of Camocypris which is what this used to be. Uh, Camocypris lawsoniana, which really hates it here. It's not a very good plant. You can keep them alive. Some cultivars you can keep alive for a while, but they're not really generally very good long-lived plants. This is one of the parents of Leyland cypress. Uh, we will talk a little bit more about the, the names for the name of Leyland cypress because all the name changes for here it gets fun there too. But Jubilee, this, this uh, Cupressaceous plant, Jubilee, <laughs> uh, really makes a, this very narrow. We actually have a, a branch down low that, that is growing up and making this a fuller plant than it would otherwise be. If we had taken this out when it was young, what you get is a trunk that's straight up and then everything else kind of hanging real, real uh, gently down. And with age, it gets to be this real Dr. Seussian plant that kind of um, uh, looks odd with these branches that kind of come out and then hang straight down and, and that sort of thing. Questions? How much do you think that tree's grown since you put it in? How much do I think it's grown since it was put in? I don't know the size it was when it was put well, it's, in. It's done pretty well. It, it, it will put on a foot a year? Um, 
about if if you put it in a moist well-drained soil uh with, with plenty of sun it will easily grow a foot or more a year yeah it's it, it's a fast growing tree remember this is one of the parents of leyland cypress which you know does 10 feet a year <laughs> if i remember it might have been about three feet in 2003 2004. so yeah three or four feet in three yeah that's that's doing pretty well other questions thanks for asking that i should have mentioned that's a quick grower all right we're going to go back out this way and we're going to hang a right and we're going to go all the way down to the gate going uh, to the um, field lab. Yes. Two variegated Leyland cypresses, what's more. We have Harlequin, uh, which is kind of just lightly variegated with that creamy white. And we have Star Wars, which is much more heavily variegated. These were planted at the same time. We're about the same size. Uh, you can see the difference in growth. Um, if we had had just a plain green one here, it would probably be, you know, you'd have this one, this one that much taller, and then the green one that much taller than, than um, this. So uh, they grow uh, very quick. I uh, can't remember what year they were planted. Right off. 03. So. Wow. And they were probably, uh, you know, three gallon plants when they were planted. Mm -hmm. Which would explain why they were planted so close to the gate and they have to keep pruning them. <laughs> All right. Before I tell you about these plants, I'm going to do more, and I promise I won't keep doing this. This is it. I'm going to give you more nomenclatural battles or, or confusion. The parents of Leyland Cypress were Camisipris nutcatensis, because that's what it was called, and a true Cupressus, Cupressus macrocarpa, uh, the Monterey Cypress from, from California. And it was they crossed them, and since these were two different genera, you, you had to get a, a, a new um, uh, intergeneric hybrid name, and it was X Cupressociparis uh, Leylandii. And, you know, it had hybrid vigor, it grew fast and everything. It's a wonderful plant. Uh, JC is widely uh, either credited or blamed with, with its introduction. That's not the case. He just promoted it very heavily because it was a fast-growing plant. And it did exactly what he said it would do. You put it in to make a quick hedge, and it makes a quick hedge. Now, anything that grows that quick is generally not a long-lived tree. I mean, that's oaks grow slowly, and they live a long time. You know, Leyland cypresses grow quickly. They have issues. The tops outgrow the roots, so they have problems with blowing over. Um, they get some disease issues, uh, bagworm issues. There are a lot of lot of problems with with Leyland cypresses. But but if you want a quick screen, they're great. You should just always plan on on replacing it in you know eight or ten years. Don't let it go beyond that. Well, when we decided that Xanthocypris uh, was the correct name for uh, the Camisipris nucatensis, we had to change the, the intergeneric hybrid. And the, the name that Farjan uh, used is X Cuprocypris. But if the true name of the Camisipris nucatensis is Cupressus nucatensis, then you have Cupressus nucatensis and Cupressus macrocarpa. It's no longer an intergeneric hybrid. So the name would be Cupre uh, Cupressus leylandii, uh, Cupressus x leylandii, uh, te technically. So that's that is probably, uh, with with current knowledge, the most correct name. Uh, isn't it easy? Okay, I'm really going to talk more about. I'll, I'll answer any questions about Harlequin. You, anything I say about this is is applicable to this. Only this gets bigger. I like Star Wars because I like the heavy variegation. And I like that it's slower growing. It's really more useful for most landscape situations. If you have a screen, it's rare that you need a 30 foot tall screen or more. You know, generally, you know, eight or 10 feet is plenty enough to block your, your neighbor's uh, nude sunbathing. <laughs> so, um, relatively quick growing tree. Again, this one, this one much smaller, get the heavy variegation. Once full sun, if it's growing in shade, it'll lean. Uh, the shaded side will, will die out. Um, can have some bagworm issues uh, in, in heavy soils. There, there are some real bad uh, root rot issues, and, and um, there's also a uh, a blight. And, and I can't remember. It's not circospora. I, I can't remember the, the name of the blight. Um, but you can you can always tell it because it, it really it affects mostly um, 
kind of the, the older portions of the plant. So you'll start seeing it dying at the base. And when that happens, it will not come back. Will not um, get rid of it. Uh, we, we will show you uh, one of its parents that as soon as I get out with a chainsaw is, is gone from the arboretum. <laughs> Perhaps next week. Um, I was saving it for this tour. Uh, but but Leylands, you know, they really they do what they're advertising. They grow quickly. They'll, they'll grow in, in most conditions, except for real waterlogged soils. Uh, and, and then you know, and then you get rid of them. They're kind of filler plants, so you can plant something a little more choice. What I always recommend to people who want a quick screen, plant some of these. They're cheap as dirt. Um, you, you can get them. You get them small. They grow quickly. And interplant with something else. And about the time the Leylands start interfering with the other plants you planted, cut down the Leylands, get rid of them, and. and you, the, your other stuff will fill in then. Don't let the Leylands overgrow the other things, but you know, plant every other one or something like that with some other more choice plant. That way you, you, you get a quick screen. It's relatively inexpensive because Leyland cypresses are so cheap, whereas what el the other plants you're planting might be more expensive, and you don't have to buy all those expensive plants at one time. And it's really, it's a good way to get, um, get things going. For some reason, people hate killing plants. I mean, that's what we do here. We kill plants here. I got no problem getting out with the chainsaw. Um, you don't have to wait till they die. Sometimes plants just need to go. Uh, you know, that's the way it is. So, 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 if you do it, do that. Don't mind cutting it down. Questions about about this plant or other Leylands? So it needs full sun. Yeah, it really needs full sun. Another good news. Cut it for Christmas tree, leave one branch. Three years later, you've got another full Christmas tree. Cut it, leave one branch. Three more years, you got it. There you go. Well, that's great. And then the roots won't, you know, you won't have that issue with, with too much top for the roots. You won't have all that. So we that planted mess. three in a row, and we got, I'm on a three year cycle and haven't bought a Christmas tree. I mean, they don't smell, you know, quite right, but you can. Bring so are you using tree. it just for greens or for the actual for tree. tree? We got a 13 foot tree every three years. But you can't hang hang things on yes, it. Yes, you too, can. It's too flimsy. <laughs> no, 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 you can. Um, well, that's a great idea. You, you can do that. Now, you, you do need to leave a branch. Um, you know, if you, with, with most conifers, uh, it's not all conifers, but most conifers, if you cut back beyond where there are needles, and this, is, this side's pretty good because it gets some afternoon sun, but if you cut back beyond where there's any green, it will never sprout again. Mm -hmm. Now, if you leave just a little bit of green on there, just a little bit of green needles, it will keep going. But if you go beyond that, it won't. I have a, a friend in Atlanta who, what he, he says he fastigitizes his <laughs> Leyland cypresses. And his Leyland cypresses are tall. And he gets up there with a ladder and he trims them back till there's just a little bit of green left and keeps these real narrow columns growing in his, his garden. Which, oh, I forgot a plant. That's what happens when I don't make a list. I forget the plants that I'm going to show you. Um, but we'll we'll uh, we'll hit it on the way back. Um, hey, other questions or thoughts, comments? Surely people have experience with Leland cypresses. I can tell everyone that you can see Ozzy's Leland cypress on the photograph collection online in yes. case you're interested. I think there's even oh, it's already there. In fact, there's already um, I think his ladder is positioned next to one of them. Yeah, I think he leaves that ladder there. Every, the last several times I've been there, the ladder's been up there. I think it's just lashed to it. Okay. Next plant is a camasipris, and this one um, no, nobody's tried to change the name on it, so uh, hopefully it'll stay that way. Camasipris obtusa. Uh, this is one of the the false cypresses, um, the Hinoki false cypress that. Uh, from uh, Japan um, and Taiwan, it grows in Taiwan as well. Uh, you can distinguish it because it has these very flattened uh, sprays of, of uh, foliage, uh, the Camasiparis obtusa does, um, makes a, a very a graceful tree. <clears throat> Camasiparis have been cultivated for um, centuries uh, in, in Japan. Uh, they're very adaptable to, to garden settings, and so there are literally hundreds of, of selections of Camasipras and Tusa, um, which is generally the, the best uh, species for our area, um, for the garden, um, better than Camasipras pacifera, which we'll also uh, look at. Um, you, the cultivars tend to be either nice deep cream, like this Gracilis, or else there are lots of gold cultivars. There, um, big ones and small ones and different sizes. Uh, 
most of the Camus Cypress of Tusa cultivars, mm -hmm. most, not all, have adult foliage, which is this really nice, closely impressed uh, scale-like foliage. Uh, you can also find some with juvenile foliage, which is um, more all-like. It sticks out a little bit more, a little bit more um, prickly uh, uh, to the touch. Um, Camus Cypress of Tusa's grow in, in full sun to part shade. Uh, they'll tend to be a little more open and loose in shade, but they will grow there. Uh, I had always said they were they had really good drought tolerance until uh, 2007 when we started getting a lot of damage on some of the Camus Cypress. Uh, they're, they've got pretty good drought tolerance, but not 100 year drought, drought tolerance. Um, Gracilis is one of the oldest cultivars. It's smaller than the species. The species would form a, a large tree uh, fairly quickly. You, you almost never can find the, the pure species uh, in the trade. Um, we, they're, you know, a lot of times the Japanese garden, they're cloud pruned like, like these have been, um, and open them up and um, see um, but, but easy plants for, for the garden, for typical garden soil. Oh, I should mention fruit on Camisipris is, is typically smaller than Cupressus. We saw the, the fruit on that uh, Cupressus arizonica. Um, the fruit on Camisipris obtusa is generally uh, around um, translate, 8 millimeters, 10 millimeters. Um, so, you know, marble size or smaller uh, generally on Camisipris obtusa. Camisipris pacifera, which we'll look at, has even smaller. Uh, Questions? How about light for that one? Light, full sun to, to part shade, to light shade, yeah. You know, in this, uh, during the summer when, when this uh, uh, crepe myrtle is in, is in full leaf, this gets you know, pretty significant shade during the, the you know, latter half of the day. You know, it gets morning sun, but not much uh, afternoon sun uh, as the sun goes over this way. So. Uh, is related to this right? This is Gracilis. This is Gracilis. There's a name too, right? Yes. There's Nana Gracilis. That's probably the most common, most used uh, cryptomeria, uh, Camisipris obtusa, Nana Gracilis. You get kind of this um, coral branching effect is how it's often described. It's, it's much like this deep dark green, uh, but, but kind of uh, smaller. Although Nana Nana meaning small can get still get to be pretty large. You can, you can grow to uh, 15 or 20 feet. And, and I'll mention that while we're talking about this. Uh, people talk about dwarf conifers. There's no such thing as a dwarf plant. Only slow growing plants. Uh, dwarf conifers are not as slow growing in the south as they are farther north and in England and places like that. Our long seasons, high night temperatures really push a lot of these plants. That's why some of them won't grow here, but even the dwarf ones tend to get much bigger than, than they do other places. We're going to show you one that, that a lot of the literature uh, really describes it as, you know, a, a bowling ball size or slightly larger, and we'll see how, how large it is. Other questions? That, that is Gracilis also. It's the same thing. Those have just been pruned, uh, cloud pruned to be a little more open. So they're they don't come back for, for Oh no, that'll keep growing. Um, between the branches? Uh, well, oh no, it won't, it won't put out new growth from the okay. trunk, no. Is there a reason for that cloud growth? Is it just uh, getting rid of dead branches? Or is it just the foliage here? Uh, that, that's the look we're looking for, you know, traditional Japanese look. Cloud pruning involves, uh, with, with any plant, not just conifer, but with any plant, really, really involves um, leaving a Kind of circling the, the trunk with the stem. You want you know you have one here. You don't want you don't don't want branches on top of each other. You want them off uh, from each other. And you prune everything on the bottom side of the branch. If this was a branch like this, you would prune out that, prune out this, and everything would be on the, the top side of the branch. And then you typically prune it in so it doesn't keep growing out. And, you know, it's a way of it's a way of controlling the growth. This plant because it's another one that you'll find a lot of times in the trade, uh, and it's uh, it's got a slightly different growth habit. Um, this is another Camisipris obtusa. Uh, again, most of the Camisipris in our collection are obtusa because it is a better plant for this area. Um, but uh, you can see where that other one was very these very flat kind of uh, uh, blunt-headed uh, sprays of foliage. The this one Tetragona aurea 
has um, more elongated sprays. They're still flat, but the, the branchlets come out, instead of coming out all one plane, come out all the way around the, the stem. Uh, tetragona, tetra is four, um, aurea is for gold, the new growth is very gold, you can see some of the gold on there. Um, much more upright pyramidal plant than, than uh, the gracilis, much different texture than you get from the gracilis, but same species. Again, they've been selected for years and years, so they've, um, there's a lot of different forms. Um, I will also mention another uh, care uh, tip for a lot of conifers, but especially a lot of the camisipras. They'll hold their, their dead needles in, on the interior. Um, there's no problem with the plant, that's just what it does, they don't drop off. And so if you come through and you clean that out, you'll really brighten up the plant a lot. It makes a huge difference when you go through a whole plant and do this. Um, a lot of people, uh, if you, are you familiar with Boulevard Fall Cypress? The, the blue? That's one that's notorious for really keeping a lot of the needles inside, and it can really look kind of dingy. You buy it, and it's this bright silvery blue, and then over time the landscape seems to kind of fade. If you go in there and chuck all the, need, the old needles like this, all this brown out of there, uh, it'll really get it to kind of pop and, and be, be a real vibrant color again. Mark, I'm going to follow your other advice. I'm cutting mine down. I'm tired of that nonsense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. Well, it's too it, big for work. Yeah, I mean, it's out. it's it's another one of those plants that's sold as a kind of medium-sized plant. It's not. It's big. Um, a lot of these plants grow much more than they're giving credit. Where you pull the brown needles out of there, you like regenerate trainers. It bear. will not regenerate anything past. You know, say this branch here, there's green back to right here, it will never put green out so in here. Them. And it really won't put anything back, it'll keep growing right here. Now I could prune it back to here, and there's a little green branch here, and this branch would grow from there. If I pruned behind there, it would probably never put out another branch. Camisipras can sometimes, will sometimes um, sprout out, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to count on it. Um, but but really, it's going to keep growing there, you won't, you won't get much growth back in there. Um, Sometimes if it's real, if you're real desperate, you can do some wounding of the, the stem a little bit. Uh, take like a, a pair of pliers that you know they have that little rough part in there for and kind of just tear the, the bark a little bit. And sometimes you can it'll throw out uh, some branches there, but not always. Other questions? Your best bet is to keep things trimmed when they're young. Uh, to keep them nice and full and dense. If you want them small, you want them denser. That, that's the best, the best method. Is not to just let things go until they get way too big and then try and deal with them. Because then you got to cut them down like, like Charlie's uh, told me. Yeah, I thought I was burning my <laughs> uh, This next plant we're going to talk about is Camisipras pacifera. Um, this one is is Filifera, one of the threadleaf forms of Camisipras pacifera. Um, we'll go up to it, but just so you can kind of see the the whole the whole plant. Alright, this is the, the other Japanese species of Camisipras, Camisipras pacifera, uh, the Sawara false cypress. Um, in this form, which is a threadly form, um, filifera, the, the needles are more like a cupressus where they're kind of the same on both sides. So you get these thread-like foli foliages instead of the, the typical more flattened sprays like Camisipras obtusa. Um, does anybody know what pacifera means? Who knows their Latin? Anybody know what the, the uh, sweet peas, what the, their Latin name is? Pisum, Pisifera, the pea-like. This is the Camisipras, the pea-like Camisipras, and it's called that because of the fruits. That's how you can, one way to identify the species um, between uh, Camisipras Pisifera and Camisipras obtusa, or Camisipras Pisifera and Camisipras uh, uh, formosana is the size of the fruits. I don't, see fruits on here but there oh there's some over there if you go around the corner yeah this is it yeah you got some fruits here and you see they're they're pretty small they're they're um, pea sized you see these these little fruits so that's that's one way to remember that Camisipras pacifera the, the pea like fruits see Latin is fun um, Camisipras pacifera the species and these these thread leaf types typically grow very well for us. Um, they'll become, the, uh, the, the, um, the species will become large trees. The, the threadly forms uh, can become pretty large. Uh, there are some more dwarf ones, um, although many of the dwarf ones really aren't that dwarf. Uh, they're not even that slow growing once they get established. 
a lot of gold ones. You see gold mops, uh, cypress, uh, gold mops, fall cypress. That's a Camus cypress, pacifera, filifera. Uh, I always say that I went to a, 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 a flower show, the Maymont Flower Show in Richmond with my mother while I was still in school in horticulture. And I walked by and said, oh, look, Camus cypress, filifera, orionana, the dwarf gold thread cypress. And I think that was the first time she ever thought that her money was being spent on <laughs> something besides uh, beer and pizza. <laughs> um, this is one plant, you can see it's kind of um, come up from, from root suckers or layered branches as, as this was under, it kind of cleared it out and kept it as a grove because it's, it's really a, a neat um, shape. Uh, but you can see with time, both this and the other uh, Camisiparous uh, species, if, if they get large, have really attractive um, kind of purpley brown bark that peels off in these long thin strips. Um, real, really pretty nice. Uh, you know, if you plant it and give it a, a, a couple decades, you know, you can have something this good too. It's all about all about time. Um, mostly like full sun, they'll tolerate a little bit of shade. But even the the cultivars, the smaller cultivars, don't like shade as much as Camisiparis obtusa. Also, unfortunately, the cultivars don't seem to be quite as heat and drought tolerant. So they want more sun but they're not as heat and drought tolerant. The exceptions are many of these thread leaf um, forms. Questions about Camisiparis pacifera? Uh, several years ago when I was on a tour like this with some other director or whatever, was, he said that when this plant was brought in here, what, 30, 40 years ago? On the label it said dwarf. Yeah, that, yeah I, I, that doesn't surprise me. Um, there are, I, I've seen uh, Camisiparis pacifera, filifera orionana, the dwarf gold thread cypress. So it's gold, so it has less chlorof chlorophyll, and it's called dwarf. And uh, yeah, they're, they're 35 feet tall. Yeah. Dwarf's all relative. The species grows 60 or 80 feet tall. It's smaller than that. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you can't, you can't trust uh, dwarf on any conifer. Capressus funebris. The, the morning cypress, and that's morning with a, a U, M O U R N. And it, it gets that name because it's traditionally been used for coffins. Uh, it's very durable uh, wood, uh, it lasts long. So uh, in China, it, it's also one of the larger trees, and you know, you need big trees to make, uh, to make coffins because you got to get a lot of wood out of there. So that's, that's where it gets that name, morning um, cypress. And of course, it's also weeping, you know, kind of so. It, it fits well. Um, this is a plant that has sometimes been confused with Camisiparis in the wild because it's it's a little uh, sprays of foliage are kind of flat like a Camisiparis, not so rounded like a, um, a typical Capressus. But but really everything else lumps it in with Capressus, including the DNA work. It's got fruit that are generally larger, like a, like a Capressus, um, and uh, it, heavy flowering. And we're seeing it now. Uh, see the pollen coming out of here. Uh, everybody gets to sneeze now. Um, these are the pollen cones. And it's one of the heavier uh, coning conifers I've ever come across. Every one, every mature one I've ever come across has just, just loads and loads of these con these uh, pollen cones and they tend to be pretty long. Really an attractive plant. Grows great for us. I don't know why it is not more widely grown. Um, really wants a pretty sunny spot, but it'll grow in some shade. It'll just be even more open in the shade. Um, but there's really graceful, graceful character on it um, as it grows. Uh, it's uh, um, very uh, uh, drought tolerant. Uh, once it's established, it's one of the more drought tolerant of the compressors, I think. Um, just, just a great plant. Grows big, though. And as far as I know, there are no selections of it at all. Questions or thoughts? It's also fast growing. It's pretty fast growing, yeah. It's it's not um, uh, it's not like uh, say a Leyland cypress, but but it is pretty fast growing. And in my experience, it's it's well rooted, a well rooted compressus, unlike uh, some of the Arizonicas sometimes. And that may just be because it's stiffer and it tolerates winds. A I mean, it's not as stiff and tolerates winds a little better. Other questions? Okay, I, I showed the. Um, the, uh, the big thread leaf Camisiparis pacifera. This is a, a dwarf cultivar. Um, it's uh, 
Now, this is the one that, that I have been sold this plant. The first time I saw it, I was told it gets to be about the size of a bowling ball. <laughs> it's a big bowling ball. Uh, this is one called Golden Pincushion, and it's supposed to be a little more gold than it is. Probably in England and the Pacific Northwest, it's, it's wonderful. The, the gold and variegated Camisipris pacifera's really struggle for us. Um, they can live, I mean, it's living and growing, but they don't look like uh, you want them to. They don't look like you see them when you, you see them in um, uh, Seattle. Uh, it's um, So it's kind of a, a double-edged sword. When you get one that lives, it still doesn't look quite like it should. Um, golden pincushion is one that, that uh, often will have juvenile foliage. Ours is old enough that it doesn't have the juvenile foliage, that more all-shaped foliage. Um, but the, the, the foliage you do see here is real typical of uh, an adult Camisipris pacifera, not those threadleaf types. Kind of um, almost a plasticky uh, uh, spray, flat sprays of foliage that tend to curve over a little bit. Um, uh, so, so it's one of the ways I distinguish it from Camisipris obtusa. Uh, on the backs, uh, you see some, some white, uh, waxy growth on the bottom. Uh, often on Camisipris obtusa, you get these white X's, uh, and then you get these white kind of patches on the back of here. People, you read in books that that's the way to identify these two. Well, let me tell you, if you looked at that Camisipris obtusa gracilis, it had almost no white on the back and certainly no white X's. Um, you, could, you could probably confuse this for some white X's on the back of here. It's a very difficult way to, to identify them. Um, easier to identify them by uh, fruit if they have it and just by the general texture and look of the, the foliage. I always find Camisipris pacifera to be a little bit spinier than, than Camisipris obtusa, uh, just a little bit uh, rougher and those curved, ed, curved uh, tips on there. Questions? All right, we'll keep moving on. We show you our native Camisipris nest. This is our one um, native Camisipris, our one native false cypress. We call it white cedar here because um, we don't know what a cedar is. We don't have any true cedars in the area. So we call junipers red cedars and Camisipris white cedar. Uh, but, but this is a Camisipris, so you can put it in with the, the false cypress. Um, Camisipris thioides, uh, our, our, our native white cedar, is, uh, it grows from the, on the east coast from Canada down into Florida. This particular form, variety Henriae, which is not always recognized as a true form, is really the, the southern um, uh, ecotype of, of Camisipris thioides. Um, it, it typically has blue, fairly blue foliage, that's why it gets named white cedar. Uh, although in the winter, it often, you often get these kind of plum tones to, to Camisipris thioides. It's real typical. Camisipris thioides grows usually in, in almost pure stands in uh, real swampy, boggy areas. So it is, it's, it's much more tolerant of wet soils than, than any other Camisipris, and really more tolerant than most other um, conifers other than like bald cypress and some of those. Now even though it grows in swamps, it does not generally grow down in low depressions. What, what happens in swamps is you get big trees, they fall over, and when they fall over, you know, they kind of lift up the ground right there and form these hummocks uh, that, are, that are often kind of hollow. But you'll, you'll, that's where Camisipris thioides usually starts is on those, those hummocks that are formed. And so it's growing um, where there's lots of water, but, but not, not usually in standing water. Although they can, they can do that on some occasions. Um, when really happy and well-grown, they can be pretty trees. Um, you know, this is obviously not the most beautiful thing. In, in, in general, Camisipris thioides in, in just the species form is not going to be a, a tree that you're going to plant as a specimen in your front yard. But there are some really nice um, uh, selections. There's actually one over here that kind of behind this pine, we'll look at it as we go by. Some of y'all may be able to see it. The one that's laying down, we've propagated that to restart it. That's one called Tom's Blue that's really nice blue that stays blue during the winter. There's uh, Rubicon. You can go see that in the mixed border. It's very upright. It's got all juvenile foliage on there. Um, Ericoides, uh, Andaliensis, Meth Dwarf, a lot of these blue ones uh, that are really nice. We'll look at another one with juvenile foliage right around the corner. We went by a Rubicon real fast by the last plant. And I, I was going to ask there, but I, th I thought you were going to stop. You didn't. 
I mean, that's got these brown tips. Do you know what's going on with that? I'm not sure what's going on with it. It's terribly unhappy. It's, I've never seen another Rubicon doing that before. I haven't been able to figure out what it is. Uh, it doesn't look like it's planted too deep. It doesn't get too wet there. I'm not sure what's going on with it. So not typical at all. Not typical. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, but if this is a great plant for, um, uh, you know, it's got a lot of historical value. It's what a lot of uh, ships and, and things like that were made out of. So in these coastal areas, you had Chemiciparus thioides, which was the wood was used as very uh, uh, water tolerant wood. Uh, it'll, it'll tolerant, take a lot of water. And then you had uh, longleaf pine, which was used for pitch and again for the, the wood, uh, especially for masts and things like that uh, in turpentine. So, so these two plants are what really contributed to the coastal part of the, the um, southern United States being so important for uh, uh, shipbuilding. Back when we were building things out of wood. Questions? Okay, really just want to show you this to show you what, you know, the kind of variety that's out there. You know, I showed you that other Chemiciparus thioides, not the most beautiful uh, specimen uh, there is. This is a, a selection called Ericoides. Um, you can see it's juvenile foliage. It doesn't have those flattened sprays of foliage. It's got this juvenile uh, foliage. This one is is a nice blue plant during the summer. During the winter, it does this color. Does this color kind of kind of interesting? I think um, we used to use some dwarf uh, uh, Chamaecyperus thioides in con winter containers when I worked at at another garden, and we would purposely plan for uh, the uh, the color change into the, these kind of silvery plum colors and use burgundy pansies and that kind of thing with them. They really uh, they they work well together. Um, some get really, really plum uh, colored, not, not so silvery like this, but kind of different. Um, and during the summer, really, really uh, quite pretty. Uh, so they, they can be, you know, they're not all these kind of scraggly looking things. They can be some really nice um, selections. Mark, on that last plant, how long do they keep their juvenile foliage? Though, the question was, how long does a plant like that last one keep its juvenile foliage? Ideally forever. I mean, it's a selection of uh, yeah. a, a juvenile foliage one that if, if they age out of that, they kind of are no longer ericoides, um, you know, so that you really want them to, to keep that. You'll see that sometimes like with uh, Camiciparus pacifera boulevard, that's a juvenile foliage form. It's kind of that ferny blue foliage. Sometimes that will throw sports that, that are um, not uh, juvenile anymore. One that's real, that does that a lot is one called um, Blue Dwarf. You find it in the trade. It's not not a valid name, but Blue Dwarf looks like uh, Boulevard and it grows much slower than Boulevard, except for it reverts all the time. So you get this little mound of blue ferny foliage and then these long shoots coming out of it. It's it's really strange looking. What would a plant have juvenile growth and then it would change? I mean, from a evolution, not evolution, but just a, adapting to the environment. Why would it have? Why would it do that? Uh, well. Um, I'm not. I'm not entirely certain. If I were to hazard guess, juvenile foliage is usually um, it's usually denser and fuller and pricklier, so maybe a, a grazing thing. Um, it also has more generally has more surface area um, out for for sun from coming from different directions. Um, but I don't know. Does anybody know that? And and then it's you know juvenility and and and. Uh, non-juvenile it, it's 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 about reproductive juvenile a plant with juvenile foliage won't form cones ever uh it, it goes into a more a mature um reproductive phase but i don't know from a adaptive standpoint really what what the whole reason behind that is you know i've never i've never read anything that i can think of that, that talks about that i'll have to look and see if i can figure something out like that that's it's, a, it's an interesting thought all right, uh, we do have several cupress, other cupressus species here. This is cupressus dargilingensis right here. We have right beside it, um, probably playing much, much too close, is cupressus uh, diclosiana, um, some different ones. For the most part, what you get are these kind of soft textured, upright, um, large trees. Over time, the, the tips on the, this um, dargilingensis will really kind of cascade out, uh, makes a really uh, uh, kind of beautiful soft edged large tree um, uh, green foliage uh, cupressus dargilingensis can sometimes have really blue foliage as well um, there are some some blue selections of this full sun you can see what happens when it's shaded it's 
basically there's nothing growing on this side where it's shaded by the, the elm here. Um, really wants uh, sun. Uh, so you have to give these a nice open spot. If you've got parkland or, you know, it's a large spot, they're perfect. Um, quarter acre lot, not necessarily the best terrain. Unless you're in one of those places where they bulldozed everything and there's, there's no shade around. Uh, that is good. Grows pretty quickly, not as quickly as some of the other compressors, but um, fairly drought tolerant, pretty easy to grow. Questions or thoughts? So that looks like it's got flattened needles like Timmy Cypress did. So the way you tell them the fruit mainly? Um, well, it really does. When you when you get up close, it's 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 got the rounded uh, foliage. Now that you okay. got you got to throw out the the thread leaf uh, camisipris because yeah. that's you know kind of a, an outside. But but really, when you get it's it seems like it's kind of held in flat and sprays. But when you look at the actual branchlets, uh, the the needles are held kind of um, you can't distinguish between them. But then the, the way you would dis, you would tell this apart from from other cupressus is you look at the fruit foliage, you know, all, all kinds of things. They're hard to tell apart. If you, if you bring something like this to a botanist, even one who does conifers well, the first thing they'll ask you is where is it from? <laughs> because then they can rule out three quarters of them. You know, if if they, you say hey, this comes from you know the Assam region of India, they're gonna say okay, maybe this is um, uh, Himalayaca. You know, they 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 that's the the easiest way to tell them apart. It doesn't say made on, made in Taiwan. No, it doesn't say made in Taiwan. <laughs> and let me tell you. I, the Camasipris in Taiwan, there's two, they grow side by side, they grow in mixed stands, and I had more information about which one was which. And I don't know if I just got, it was unlucky, in, in six weeks in Taiwan, I never saw uh, Camasipris formosensis. I only saw Camasipris obtusa variety formosana. And I'm not sure if that's because I couldn't tell them apart, and so I, I, uh, I always went with Camasipris obtusa uh, formosana that I knew a little bit better, or what. But I never saw Camasipris formosensis, and I mean I had keys and all kinds of things, and somewhere along the way I should have I should have seen. It. I take it back. I did see it once because uh, it had a sign on it in a <laughs> here, and I couldn't tell it apart then. So, you know, no. so it can be tough. All right, I've got one more plant we're gonna look at and it's really to show you what some of the issues with compressors. That and to finish up our whole Leyland Cypress saga because it's the other, the other parent. <laughs> All right, this is the other parent of Leyland Cypress, Compressus macrocarpa. This is it in a gold form, um, Donner gold. Uh, unfortunately, not a wonderful plant specimen now. It, uh, very quickly this, uh, Oh, and I never, I never can remember the, the name of the the fungal disease. Anybody know it? Mm-hmm. Start with a C. Um, is there sitting on this? I think it's Cryptospora. I can't remember. Anybody who really wants to know can get back in touch with me. I'll, it'll, it'll come to me in a half an hour or so. <laughs> uh, but this was a beautiful specimen. Um, you know, this time last year it was gorgeous. This time, you know, just a few months ago, it was gorgeous. And then all of a sudden it goes and it and it hits it quick and really um, does a number on it, kills it, kills it fast. Uh, and so this plant will be removed, uh, which is unfortunate because because we really liked it right here anchoring this corner. Um, Compressus macrocarpa, the Monterey cypress, grows uh, on you know kind of the the California coast. It's one of those, one of those real um, uh, distinctive uh, trees. If you if you see pictures of kind of the um, Big Sur area, Monterey area of California. This is what's always, you know, in the sunset with the cliffs behind it, um, going down to the ocean. Um, so I really wanted to point this out to show you what what this disease will look it looks like, and, and it can it can happen on any compressus, but some like compressus macrocarpa are really susceptible. Um, Leyland cypresses have picked up their susceptibility to this from uh, compressus macrocarpa, but compressus macrocarpa is incredibly quick growing. So if it does this, you can plant another one in a couple of years. You'll have a nice big plant again. So it's not the soil. It's not. Uh, no, it's it's. Well, if you have, if we were to put a, a compressor right here again, we we would get uh, probably three to five years of, of really nice good growth, and then it would hit it again. But it tends to it, it tends to young plants will, will grow through it um, for a few years before it really shows up. Um, but then when it does show up, it's your your plant's gone in a matter of months. Um, Compressus macrocarpa can be grown as a house plant. That's actually how I learned it as a house plant. Um, 
unfortunately there's not a lot of good foliage. People who've seen this on a, when I do this on a tour, which I've done in the past, it smells like um, lemon pledge. The, the foliage on there smells just like lemon pledge, it's kind of neat. Um, but uh, there are a lot of gold ones, gold crest, gold pillar, a lot of those out there. And this is not the, the Monterey section. It is. Yeah. And when you see pictures of that out there, it's, does that mean there's sort of trunks and they're, they're flat topped and feet tall? Yeah. Yeah, and that's just like, uh, oh, you know, think of a pine tree, you know, they're kind of pyramidal when young, but then when they get old, they're flat topped and, you know, much different. You get, you know, start getting that kind of look on uh, a pine rather than more pyramidal. And, and same thing with uh, a lot a lot of conifers. They get to a certain point and then just kind of flat top and, and get, get very large. Uh, you know, our growing conditions are quite a bit different than the Monterey area, so um, they don't have these issues out there. Any other thoughts, questions? Um, that's like the plant company that's promoting a plant that's supposedly an alternative to mowing the cycle that is not so susceptible to disease. Thuya green giant, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, no, it's an arborvitae, Thuya. Um, it, it's, a, it's a good plant. Uh, there's still some issues with it. Uh, but it, it grows very quickly, uh, gets very large, very, very large. Um, you know, really most of those plants, plants like that are too big for most landscapes. If you live in a neighborhood, there is no call for Thuya Green Giant or Leyland Cypress or anything like that, because they're just too darn big. Leyland Cypress, in fact, are better because they will die sooner. Um, <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> you know, they're just, they're really, really large uh, trees. So, so better off looking for a more uh, moderate size plant, unless you are, you know, you've got a big business and you want to shield it from the highway or something like that and you have a lot of space. Uh, through, through your Green Giant does have some problems, um, not, not as bad as Leyland Cypress. They tend to be, to root in much, much better, although there can still be some wind throw problems with them. Problem with any really quick growing conifer. Um, is, is the tops just outgrow the bottoms and so you don't have the stability um, that, that you would have uh, otherwise. Um, mostly because you're coming from areas where they don't grow, the tops don't grow as quickly. You know, maples grow quickly, red maples grow quickly, but they're from here and the roots grow quickly too. Uh, so they, they kind of keep up. Um, you know, there's some other, you know, like uh, Thuya smarged or emerald is, is just sold here a lot. You know, that's, that's more, eight to 12 foot tall, you know, narrow conifer that fits much better into the landscape. It's slower, so if you plant them small, they're, you know, they're more expensive because they're slower growing and they're, they take longer to, to really block something, but in the long run, it's a better, you know, it's a better choice uh, usually than, than uh, the potato. Like that steeplechase? Steeplechase, the steeplechase is, yeah, very similar to, to a green giant. It's a little slower and it doesn't, Green Giant, it grows, and you'll get you, you get this. The tip will grow really long. You'll get this really sparse tip, you know, that's this much above the rest of the plant. And then the next year, it kind of catches up with that and throws out another one of those. Steeplechase doesn't do that quite as bad. It stays more of a, a dense pyramidal shape growing up, but still grows quick. About two thirds the size. That's what I'm told. I don't believe it. Maybe a third slower growing. Ultimately, I think they're going to get to the same size, really. Other thoughts? Well, I have a event comment. One of the most common questions is where to get all the plants. We're planning a trip out to the Western Nurseries in North Carolina on September 7th, 8th, and 9th. And I believe we're visiting five specialty nurseries on, on that trip. So it'll be a fun one. We should have the announcement coming out real soon. And one of those is a conifer specialty nursery, and he's I've, I've, he's told me what he charges, and I think he gets confused between wholesale and retail because all the prices really seem a lot closer to wholesale than to, to retail to me. So. <laughs> uh, what were the dates again? September 7th, 8th, and 9th. Do we have a price on it? Uh, it, it can't quote me, or please don't quote me, but I believe it's 235 for individuals that are members and 325 if you're going to be single occupancy in the, in the hotel room. Then that will include the uh, two-night stay and the bus transportation, and there's breakfast provided uh, at the hotel on both days. Did you know off the top of your head what nursery? Uh, I can show them to you in my office in a little bit. 
Yeah, I can't. I can't remember all. Of them. I know Apple Dorn Landscape Nursery is the kind of for nursery, and we do. We do. It's not we do anymore. No, it's Meadow Meadow View, Meadow something. Meadow Brook Meadow View, uh, which was the old we do nursery. Um, if you're familiar with that, then Japanese maple on. folks. Uh, yeah, Mr. Maple, which is great Japanese. Uh, uh, maple nursery um, and we're having lunch at his relatives I think yeah can't remember if hillside's on there or not it might be could be can't remember <laughs> we had a no, volunteer help us set Asheville. it up so it was not as deeply embedded in my head where we're going <laughs> but but it would be a great it's a nursery buy it's a nursery visiting trip it's you know we're not visiting Biltmore when we go out to that side of the, the state we're we're visiting nurseries and buying plants so the list of nurseries is on the website already. We just don't have complete details yet in the announcement. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank thank you Mark. You.